Today's Palm Sunday, and I want to start with a story. So at 7.51 a.m. on Friday, January 12th in 2007, it was the middle of rush hour uh, in the metro station in D.C., right near LaFont Plaza, um, a violinist began to play. And over the next 43 minutes, he played six classical pieces, and they counted how many people passed them by. And there were 1,097 people that went by this violinist uh, playing his violin, and 27 of the 1,097 stopped. So that people passed them by, not that surprising, right? I've been there, I've done that. But who they passed by is really where the story gets interesting. See, the violinist who was dressed in jeans and a long sleeve t shirt and a ball cap was a man named Joshua Bell. Three days before that event in DC, he was in Boston selling out their symphony hall at over $100 a ticket. He plays in the kind of performances where he would normally wear a tux, not a ball cap, and if you cough twice, they'll throw you out. He, uh, and he always performs on the same instrument. Now, he has a, a name for his violin. Now, I, I think he could maybe do better than the name for his violin. Like, I was hoping for, like, Excalibur, Kingslayer, or something like that. Um, but he calls his the Gibson X Huberman. I don't know what that means. But he bought it. Um, it's a 19... Or, I'm sorry, it's a 1713 Stradivarius. Now, I don't know anything about violins, but I know that a Stradivarius is good, right? And he bought it for just north of three and a half million dollars. And, and the, the school, I, the college I went to, there was a music school, and I remember somebody saying, this is a person going to be um, an orthopedic surgeon, and she said, I'll own my home, I'll own many things, I'll probably never own my violin. Um, these violins are just extraordinarily expensive. So, Bell, the best violinist in the world, is playing the best violin, and he's not just playing any old song. He's not like pounding out like green sleeves to see if he can you know, sell some ice cream, right? He played Chaconne, which is a song so fancy, I probably pronounced it incorrectly. <laughs> it's one of Bach's pieces, and when Bell talked about why he picked that piece to play, he said it's not just one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, but one of the greatest achievements of any man in human history. It's incredibly difficult to master. If you are a great violinist, you still may not be able to play that song. And so as Joshua Bell, the best violinist in the world, is playing a $3.5 million violin uh, and playing the most difficult song in the world, uh, all but 27 of 1,097 people just passed him by. Of the 27 that stopped, they gave him $52, right? Half the price of a sold-out concert hall. And... Some of it doesn't, you know, the people that write about this say, like, well, 20 of it doesn't count because somebody recognized him, and that was the person that put in 20. Most of what he got was pennies and nickels and dimes, which you can tell it was a while ago. Do people still carry pennies, you know? Um, And uh, when they uh, wrapped up their research, they tracked down some of the people who passed him by. So they caught up with Calvin Mint, um, and when they asked him about the violinist, he said, I don't actually remember a violinist playing this morning. They talked to Jackie Hassan, and she said, yeah, I saw the violinist, but nothing about him struck me as much of anything. They caught up with Edna Souza, who's been shining shoes in LaFont Plaza for decades, and her verdict was that Bell was just a little too loud. (laughs) The only consistent group of people that stayed and stopped were children, who could tell something great was going on, but you can see in the videos, you can look this up on, uh, on YouTube, that they're kind of tugging on their parents to stay, and the parents, who are larger, just tug them the other direction. See, why didn't people stop to see the best violinist playing the best violin and maybe the best song on the violin ever? It's because they weren't looking for something extraordinary in the daily activity of their lives. Paul Geyer Research says this. He says, to properly appreciate beauty, the viewing conditions must be optimal. This guy sounds like he doesn't know things about real life, right? Our viewing perspective isn't always optimal in our daily lives. You can just imagine being one of those people trying to get to work, fighting through the crowds and having a violinist go by and you, just like they, did not notice him. Easter week is like that experience. Easter week, we are going to see the greatest person that the world has ever seen, living the greatest life the world has ever seen, giving the world the greatest gift it has ever received. And we run the risk of missing him. Because we aren't looking for greatness in our daily lives. Holy Week is this time to stop and see what Jesus did. Holy Week is actually described as the 
passion of Jesus. It's his life's work. It's the climactic, pinnacle achievement of what he did with his days here. And so this week, let's just name it. You may not have optimal viewing conditions this week. You might be busy. You might be tired. You might be just in a bad mood. This might feel like just any other week. But I implore you, will you with me this week commit to looking for Jesus and listening for His voice? Because the greatest guy, the God of the universe, did His most masterful work this week. And all week here at this church, we get to celebrate that. So let's look and listen for Jesus. This morning, we'll start with his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. And as he did this, he made four decisive actions to tell us what triumph really looks like. And his four decisive actions were that he came, he cleansed, he cured, and he cursed. He came, cleansed, cured, and cursed. Let's look first at he came. We'll start in Matthew 21, verse 1. It reads like this. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. If we know anything about the life of Jesus, we know that he wanted to live his life according to the book. God's word, Holy Scripture, was where he took his lead. It's just one of the many features of his life that we ought to emulate. And Jerusalem was the place where his earthly ministry would come to its conclusion. And so that's where Jesus headed. There's a part in his ministry where the Gospels actually say he turned his face towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And that's where he was headed, even though he knew what awaited him. Prophecies from the Old Testament foretold that the Messiah would come down off the Mount of Olives, where Jesus began this journey. And in fact, Mount Olives was where Jesus would then ascend into heaven. I got to go to uh, Israel uh, last year, and I got to stand on the spot, you know, supposedly where Jesus then went back up into heaven. It was on that mountain. Do they have the exact spot? Maybe, maybe not, but it happened there. These were real events that happened in real history that we can talk about and research. And Scripture said that this Messiah would come in riding on a donkey. The Messiah, the guy that would come in and take over and cleanse the temple, would be coming in on a donkey. Now, this tells us something about the nature of Jesus. It tells us about these dualities he has that are true about him. He's both divine and human. He is messianic, king, and modest. He has authority and approachability. One commentator put it like like this. He said, Jesus must be defined in two ways. He is the crucified Messiah. He is the modest king. He is the lowly Lord. And he is the human God. The New Testament gospel reveals or revels in this duality. Deny either of those dualities, his deity and his humanity, and the spell of the gospel is broken. So the king of all kings, the great Messiah conqueror, The one who could say, my dad owns the cattle on a thousand hills, rode in on a donkey, a borrowed donkey at that. Let me tell you some things I recognized about donkeys. Donkeys are like a good crock pot. They run on low and slow. They are stubborn. They're made for work. They are slow enough that you can keep up with them, especially when you're carrying someone like me. They're low enough that you can be on eye level with the person. Have you ever seen a, a, a cop on a mount, you know, mounted police officer? It is all about intimidation. You can't get close to that thing. When you are on a donkey, you can come right up next to me. You can almost look me in the eyes. It's that kind of humility that Jesus would have riding in on this. So if you were a king, you'd ride in on a white stallion. And everything about how you came in would be intimidation and power. And everything about how Jesus came in was Get close. Approach me. Well, as he comes in, the story continues. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They, bought the, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. 
Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, we've come to the events where we notice how this day, Palm Sunday, gets its name, and how this event, the triumphal entry, gets how its title. See, what's happening is Jesus is shaming what was a Roman celebration of power. It's almost a a parody. See, to call this a triumph, if you were to just look at the details, it doesn't feel that much like a triumph. Because in that day and age, a triumph was a sanctioned Roman celebration. It was a very particular way that they would come into a city after a military victory. That word triumph, there was was regulations on how that had to happen. It had two main characteristics. It was militaristic and it was religious. So first, this Roman triumph was militaristic. You only got a sanctioned triumph if you won a battle in which 5,000 or more people died. And as a display of your power, you would take the ones who hadn't been killed but captured in battle, and you would have them either at the front or the back of your procession so they could be jeered and shamed and mocked by the crowds. These are the kind of things you can look up. They actually happened. The um, Jewish king Aristobulus was defeated by the Roman Pompey, and Pompey had a triumph-worthy victory. And so he led 300 Jewish prisoners in front of him to be jeered and mocked, and eventually put to death. And no expense was spared. And you know how Pompey came into town? He did not go the donkey route. He went with what's called a quadriga. A quadriga is a giant chariot that needs four white stallions to to carry it and propel it in. Everything about what Pompey wanted to communicate was power. He wanted you to take one look at how he came in and for you to recognize he is the guy in charge. Well, these celebrations, these triumphs, they weren't just militaristic, they were religious. See, the person who won the victory would go straight into the temple, they were often revered as immortal, and they would offer sacrifices, declaring that God, or the gods, were on our side. And they didn't care what temple, they just wanted the most important temple. And so in this case, they would make a beeline into the temple, it was supposed to be dedicated to the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and they would offer pagan sacrifices, essentially, to themselves. They would mint coins. They would celebrate their victory. You can find these from the victories of Augustus and Tiberius, and they'll have pictures of them on that quadriga coming into town. These are real events that happened. And oh, by the way, Pontius Pilate would have just come into Jerusalem for Holy Week for exact, in exactly this fashion. See, Pilate was in Jerusalem for Passover, not because he wanted to celebrate, because he wanted to keep those Jews in line. It was a show of force. The city would swell to almost 10 times its normal size. And do you remember what Passover celebrates? Passover celebrates the last time God released Israel from their oppressive captors. And so uh, Pontius Pilate would come into town not to offer moral support, but to flex his military muscles and remind them of who is really in charge. For Jesus to come in in this fashion was to mock and to scorn and to shame the way that Roman power came into town. What Jesus did would not have appeared as triumphant, and yet he won the greatest victory that the world has ever seen. And what's interesting is, it, sometimes when I imagine the story in my head, I'm imagining the people of Jerusalem, like all at the gates, can't wait to invite him in. If you read the text carefully, which I always encourage, God always rewards a careful reading of the text, you'll find that the people that shout Hosanna and lay those palm fronds on the ground and their cloaks on the ground are not the people of Jerusalem. They're the people that were with Jesus. It says that the people that went ahead of him and the people that were with him created this celebration. He has convinced no one in Jerusalem yet. And so this triumphal entry has to be staged by the people that were already with Jesus. So some would have seen it, but the vast majority missed it. Jesus, because he didn't look like what he was supposed to look like, was missed by most. Just like that violinist. 
He wasn't in a concert hall. He wasn't wearing his tux. And yet he was the greatest musician, playing the greatest instrument, and playing the greatest song, and people passed him by. And the same thing happened to Jesus. Jesus is playing the most masterful music the world has ever seen. And most people didn't recognize him and didn't pay him mind. See, they were so fixated on looking for what he was supposed to look like. Just like a violinist is supposed to wear a tux, the Messiah is supposed to come in on a white horse with power and glory and overthrow the Roman authorities. He needed to be more powerful than that, not weaker than the authorities that he came in. And instead, Jesus comes in humbly on a borrowed donkey. And he came in not to celebrate all the enemies he's vanquished in combat, but to celebrate all of the souls that he would save through his sacrifice. So the first decisive action Jesus took was that he came. The second is that he cleansed. And pick up that in verse 12. He says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Of course, the temple was this marquee location, this, this crucial institution in the city of Jerusalem. And to get the setting, Herod had really built up the temple at this time. It had this enormous court of Gentiles. It was many football fields large. The perimeter of the court of Gentiles was about a mile long if you were to just walk the perimeter. And it had all these little booths where you could buy an animal for sacrifice or change your currency into the temple currency, the Tyrian currency. It provided you know, a very helpful function. I mean, on these long journeys that people would uh, take to come in Jerusalem, it was tough to bring you know, your sacrificial animal on your shoulders that long way. And so they would set up shop and they would sell you Their animal, of course, at a price. And they would change your money into the money of the temple, of course, and take a cut of it. And Jesus said, this is not the way things are supposed to be. This is a house of prayer, not a house of commerce. He said, you've ruined it. So Jesus, this meek and mild, humble guy, riding in on a borrowed donkey, starts overturning tables, rearranging furniture like he owns the place. (laughs) And everybody takes notice. And what's fascinating is he drives people out. Now, as I try to just remember the story in my mind's eye, I, of course, you're saying, drive out the people that are the money changers. Drive out the people selling stuff. But again, careful reading of the text. Who does Jesus drive out? Those both selling and buying. He doesn't see the buyers just innocent bystanders, even though they may have been taken advantage of. He says that you are part of a corrupt system and you need to get out. I'm happy you're here. I'm glad you're offering a sacrifice, but don't do it in a place of prayer. Do your business outside and come in here and worship. Jesus is standing against and judging callous, casual, and transactional religion. This dramatic action that Jesus took is exactly the kind of action a prophet would take. When people asked, who is this? They said, it's the prophet, Jesus. Prophets were dramatic. They made a scene to make a point. Okay, so some of the dramatic actions you may remember. Isaiah, one of the prophets, you maybe read stuff from him, he walked around naked for three years to make a point. I think he made it, right? Hosea married a prostitute to talk about how idolatrous Israel was. And Jeremiah did things like wear a wooden yoke, wore a soiled loincloth, and shattered a clay pot. This is exactly the kind of dramatic action a prophet would take. But this is also exactly the kind of action that a Messiah would take. The Messiah was to come and cleanse the temple of all that was unfit for proper worship of God. And so Jesus is doing just that. And all throughout the Old Testament, you read things like this from the book of Ezekiel that says, judgment begin at my sanctuary. Jesus wants to clean house first. In Chronicles, it says he carry out the filth from the holy place. And Isaiah, time and time again, he says, I don't care about your sacrifices if your heart is in the wrong place, if you're abusing and taking advantage of the poor and those on the underside of power. Jesus was a man of holy zeal for God. And he walked into the temple like he owned the place and cleaned house. So Jesus, decisively, he came, he cleansed. Third, he cured. We pick it up again in verse 14. 
It says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now again, as I try to remember these stories, I don't remember this part well. That Jesus then, as soon as he kicks people out, he brought in people to heal them. And that's because Matthew is the only of the synoptic gospels, all of them except for John, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that include this story. And I think it's so important to know that this is part of what happened. See, the temple grounds had a you know, complicated relationship with the people that weren't completely well. See, way back when, when David uh, tackled and you know, overtook the, the temple, as he was doing it, he had some adversaries that got under his skin. And David was a guy, man after God's own heart, but you could get under his skin. You could get him to act brashly and irrationally. And as they were uh, mocking him, they said that even the blind and the lame will overthrow you. And so David, in a kind of incorrect overreaction, said, well, the blind and the lame can't come into the temple. Well, what is Jesus, the true Messiah, the great king in the line of David, do? As soon as he kicks out that which is unclean, he invites in those that would have been seen as unclean. He says that this temple needs cleansed, not because of those that are unwell in it, It's because you haven't invited in those that are lame and blind to be healed. All of the people looking on were fine with the money changing. They were fine with the selling animals at overrun prices. But when you started healing people, they got nervous. And when children start singing your praises, they want to get them out. We believe, just like Jesus did, that they are a crucial part of God's kingdom. They're so important. They're the next generation of the faith. And so time and time again, Jesus would say, don't keep them away from me. Let them come close. Let them be part of what I'm doing. And so while the religious authorities are saying, you know, get them out of here, Jesus is saying, no, let them come near. And then they ask Jesus a question. They say, don't you hear what they're saying? And Jesus is so, I don't, like, I don't know the right word. He's just so gangster in this moment, right? You've got to love this dude. Because he says, like, yeah, I hear him. And you could just like leave it at that, right? Like, yes, I answer your question. But then he does a power move. And I just love, he's, Jesus is so ninja. I love this, right? He asks them, the religious authorities, if they are aware of a Bible verse. When Jesus says, have you heard that it was written that I will have praise from the mouths of babies? They would say, of course we know that. But what Jesus is saying is, you are missing it. You're sailing right by prophecy being fulfilled. You're walking right by God's word being fulfilled. To a Bible scholar, those are fighting words. Have you heard about this verse? And it's not just any verse. It's from Psalm 8, where it talks about God silencing his enemies through his strength. You know where he finds his strength? In the humble praise of little children. That's all God needs to silence his enemies. Jesus walks in and he cures the temple of what was really making it sick. It wasn't the sick people that were inside. It was the religious establishment that had gone way off course. And he invites in the sick and the blind to be healed. Jesus came, he cleansed, he cured, and lastly, he cursed. Verse 18 says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Jesus shows us again his humanity and his divinity. He comes in and he's hungry. And outside he sees a fig tree and has leaves on it. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but if a fig tree has leaves on it, it always has fruit on it. And this time of year, it wouldn't have full-blown fruit. They would have had what was called early figs. And from a distance, you might not see them, but you'd see the leaves and you'd know that there was fruit on this tree. Based on its appearance and its adornment, they thought it would give life. You know, just like the temple that was adorned in an incredible manner 
believing that there was fruit inside. And so Jesus comes up to this fig tree, having been deceived by its appearance, and curses it because it was supposed to be bearing fruit. But it wasn't. And so he said, we'll find it a different way. This action with the fig tree happened right outside where the temple is. And Jesus says, the temple has all the adornment and leaves and all the appearance of bearing fruit. But it's not. It needs cleanse. It needs cured. And so therefore, he curses it. He shut down that tree just like he shut down the temple courts earlier. Jesus, this humble guy, curses the temple. Jesus said about himself, I am the one greater for the temple. And he comes in and he judges harshly the temple, cursing it because it bore no fruit. And as the disciples saw that, they reacted. They couldn't believe what happened. And Jesus says something that I need to talk about for just a few minutes. He says, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This verse is often misinterpreted to their own peril. So it gives a sense that prayer is wish fulfillment on demand. If, you, if, if, if you pray with the right faith and without doubt. A man named Kevin, Kenneth Hagin, who's the founder of the Word of Faith movement, which is an, uh, an outworking of the health and wealth prosperity gospel, wrote a book. And I want to tell you its title. And just hold on to your hats, okay? Buckle your chin straps when you listen to the title of this. And thinking about this kind of prayer on demand, he wrote a book, a slim volume, entitled How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. Four Easy Steps. When I bought this book earlier this week, I noticed that it had 4.9 stars out of 5 based on 819 ratings on Amazon. In it, he writes down that there's four simple steps that you can take to get anything you want from God. He writes this. He said he received a word from Jesus who said, if anyone, anywhere, will take these four steps and put these four principles into operation, he will always receive whatever he wants from me or from God the Father. Pretty good offer, right? He goes on. He says, you, in his book, you can receive anything in the present tense, such as salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing for your body, spiritual victory, or financial gain. Anything the Bible promises you now, you can receive by taking these four steps. I get a little worked up about this kind of stuff. Because you know what happens? Typically in teachings like this, who wouldn't want that to be true? I want everybody in here who needs financial gain and health to pray for it and for it to happen. But you know what happens sometimes? You're sick and you pray to get healed and you don't get better. And if you imbibe this theology, do you know who the problem is? You. You didn't do it right. You didn't have enough faith. Maybe a little doubt crept in when you prayed. You're the weak link in this theology. You're the one to blame for staying unwell if you believe this. It's four easy steps. How hard could it be? Just get it right. This is not just a little bit off. This kind of teaching is a lie from the pit of hell. It's aberrant. It's false. It's not innocently misguided. It's heresy. Do not believe that. If you have prayed that prayer and had somebody told you, you didn't pray with enough faith. Tell them, I would really love to introduce you to Jesus someday. He sees it differently. See, blessings of your choosing on demand is never the teaching of Jesus. The blind man, when Jesus was asked about him, why was he born blind? He said, to the glory of God. Paul prayed that the thorn in his flesh would be taken away, and it never was. And Jesus prayed that the cross would be taken from him. And we will be reminded, thankfully, time and time again this week, that it wasn't. But Jesus prayed different. He didn't pray, just take it away from me. He says, if it cannot be taken away from me, your will be done. If you want to pray a prayer that you will have the guarantee will be answered, you pray, your will be done. God is infinitely wise. He has reasons for things we will never understand this side of heaven. 
His understanding is beyond our scrutiny. If you pray for something and He doesn't give it to you, it's not because He's out to get you. There are forces at work that are beyond our understanding. And God will work all things toward good, even bad things. Do not believe you can write your own ticket with God. That's not a God, that's a genie. And we don't serve a genie, we serve a God. When he says that you can move mountains, you know what mountains in the Old Testament are? Mountains are obstacles in the way of the coming of the Messiah King. Mountains are those realities that need leveled for him and his presence to be ushered in. Mountains are pride, and in Paul's words, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Mountains are what needs to be moved so that you and I can live faithful lives of discipleship in Christ. And mountains are what God moved to bring us into His family. Don't tell me that you can write your own ticket with God. And if you are here today, and you've prayed that prayer, and somebody told you it's because you didn't have enough faith, shame on them. They're wrong, and God loves you, and you are safe in His arms when you put your faith and trust in Him, no matter what. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem, He came to the people He wanted to save. He cleansed the house of His Father. He cured the blind and the lame, and He cursed the temple. And when I look at those four things, I want everything to do with the first three. I want nothing to do with the last. When I look at this, I want Jesus to come into my life so that I can shout Hosanna and He can save me. I want Jesus to cleanse my life of all that takes me away from Him. I want Jesus to heal me and my church and everybody I love of everything that holds us back. But I don't want the curse. Do you know why? Because if Jesus took account of my life and the fruit I produce, He would see sin, the wages of which are death. Everyone stands under the curse of the debt of sin. So I want Jesus to come and cleanse and cure, but I don't want Him to curse. Because if you are outside of the love of Christ, that is what you are. Galatians 3.10 says this, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's me and that's you. We don't keep the whole law, but the gospel says That you cannot save yourself. But it doesn't say that you cannot be saved. Amen? The gospel says that the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gospel says that for our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, Holy Week, receive the word of God to you in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone and everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus, this Easter season, the reason why it's so beautiful, the reason why it's like that violinist playing the greatest music the world has ever seen, is because He took the curse you deserved on Himself so that you could be the blessed, beloved child of God. That is what we celebrate this week. Don't miss it. Jesus will be playing the most beautiful music the world has ever seen. Will you with me this week? Will you watch for Him? Will you look for Him? Will you listen for the voice of Jesus saying, I love you. It cost a whole lot, but you were worth it.